continuing our study of the Gospel of John, I have one verse for you this morning. John chapter 1 and verse 14. And it says, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Let's pray. We'll pray silently for just a moment as we get our hearts ready to receive uh, what the Lord has for us this morning from verse 14 of John chapter 1. Father, we come now humbly uh, before your throne of grace to sit at your feet and be taught of you. And you sent this other comforter, the Holy Spirit, to teach us your truth. We want to understand that truth this morning until we ask for his help as we study to show ourselves approved and we attempt to rightly divide the word of God. Help us, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Please be seated. You know, the exodus of Israel was one of the greatest mass migrations of history. I read that over two million Israelites left the bondage there in Egypt. At first, this great caravan would have had a, a certain splendor as they marched away from the control of the Egyptians and carried away some of the treasures of the Nile. But before long, as they meandered around in the deserts, the Israelites would have looked more like refugees as they became dirty and scruffy and increasingly disorganized. But even then, these Israelites had a glory that made them the marvel of the world. At the center of their camp was the tabernacle of the Lord, and above it was this cloud of fire that God used to guide his people. And inside was the Ark of the Covenant with the glory of the Lord filling the tabernacle. Now Christians are likewise unimpressive during our pilgrimage to the desert world. I don't think people look at you individually or, or Christians in general and marvel at them. Mostly they just kind of think we're weird if they're lost people. But like the Israelites, the Christian church has the glory of God in its midst. And so John writes, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. The Gospel of John, folks, was written in order to make this great statement. John's introduction has been telling of Christ coming into the world kind of in theological terms. He began by saying Jesus is the eternal word who was with God from the beginning. The word came as a light into the darkness. And now verse 14 tells us how all this happened. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. These verses are talking about the doctrine of the incarnation of Christ. As you all know, Jesus of Nazareth was born in the Virgin Mary in a stable in Bethlehem. But that wasn't when he came into being. John says right at the beginning of his gospel, in the beginning was the Word. Remember I taught you that the Word is the Greek word logos. And it has to do with the Greek mindset that you know, th this is why things happen. This is why we have seasons. This is why we have order in the world. They call it the Logos. And John says, in the beginning was the Logos. And I said, we can substitute the name Jesus and get the sense of that. The Word was there. God the Son, the Word. He didn't come into existence when he was born here on earth, but he became a human being while at the same time remaining God. Our London Baptist Confession of Faith of 1689, on page 674 in the back of your hymn book, says in chapter 8 and verse 2, the Son of God did, when the fullness of time was come, take upon him man's nature, with all the essential properties and common infirmities thereof, yet without sin. 
So Christ incarnation means that the Son of God became a human in the fullest sense without losing any part of being God at the same time. Paul teaches us in Colossians 2.9 that in him dwelleth the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Likewise, Jesus is sinless without losing his full humanity. He is uncorrupted, true humanity. Now, when John speaks of our flesh, he doesn't refer to our sinful nature, as is Paul's meaning of this term, but simply our human nature. He became flesh. He took on our human nature. John means that he gained a human body, and that was necessary because he had to suffer death for us. Jesus also possessed a human mind and a human heart. He feels what we feel, including sorrow and joy and weariness and temptation. All of those human things that we deal with, he dealt with. And because of this, he's able to sympathize with us in our trials and in our struggles. Additionally, Jesus lived a human life in the same world that we live in. He was born. He grew up as a boy. He learned to trade in his father's, his earthly father's carpenter shop. He had friends. He had neighbors. He paid his taxes. He was subject to government, the government that existed in his day. And because he truly lived as we live, Jesus sets an example for us to follow. These then are the three main reasons why the word became flesh. He came to die. He came to sympathize with us and to show us how to live. What I've just said, folks, is the most outstanding news that could ever be reported. I know you hear it all the time, but it's still the most outstanding news. C.S. Lewis said, the central miracle asserted by Christians is the incarnation. They say that God became a man. He goes down to come up again and brings the whole ruined world up with him. And Paul wrote in 1 Timothy 3.16, And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. I don't understand that. I can't get you to understand that. How can one person be God and man at the same time? I cannot explain that to you. But the Bible does show clearly that Jesus possessed two distinct nature. One was divine and one was human without any mingling or confusion between them. That's what the Bible teaches and I have to believe that. Whether I get it or understand it or can explain it or not. You know, the Greek mythologies, they had their gods, and they spoke of gods who would come down to earth for a while until they got tired or they got killed or something and return back to the clouds. But nowhere in the ancient world was there any idea of God becoming a man, the Word taking up flesh. In number 158, verses 2 and verse 5 say, Lo, within a manger lies he who built the starry skies, thus to come from highest bliss down to such a world as this. Now, what does that say about God's desire for our salvation, that he actually stepped into our world and became one of us? That's incomprehensible. It would be like somehow you and I being able to become fire ants and coming down in order to save Fire ants. I hate fire ants. They apparently don't like us because if you step in one of their mounds, they bite you and it hurts. Would I become a fire ant to save fire ants? Absolutely not. But God did. He became a human being like us in order to save us. This shows the value of every human life, given the dignity that God gave to human beings above all other creatures. First, he created us in his own image as Genesis 1.26 says, and then he sent his own son to become a son of man so that we might become in him the sons and daughters of God, as we spoke last week, being part of the family of God. 
John doesn't just tell us that the Word became flesh, but he also tell us, tells us that, the, that he dwelt among us. Now, the, this phrase uses a verb from the Greek word for tabernacle. Skenoo is the Greek word. And literally, John is saying that the word, Jesus, tabernacled among us. Now, undoubtedly, in John's thinking, he's directing our thoughts back to the Exodus when God dwelt among the Israelites in the tabernacle. Quick review here. Tabernacle was a tent structure about 45 feet long and 15 feet wide. It had three areas. The outer court, where priests made sacrifices and washed themselves before entering. The outer room, the holy place, that housed the golden uh, candlestick, the table of shoe bread, and the altar of incense. And there was the inner room, the Holy of Holies, that contained the Ark of the Covenant. And this is where God himself dwelt. Everything about the tabernacle was symbolic of spiritual realities, and especially of Jesus Christ, who became God's true tabernacle. Now, I want you to take note of some of the obvious comparisons between the tabernacle and Jesus himself. First, the tabernacle was given for Israel's wilderness journey. And so it was for Jesus. This present world was not Jesus' true home. He was passing through on the way to a better world to come. During his life, Jesus lived as a pilgrim. He said in Matthew 8, 20, the foxes have holes, the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. Same is true of us. We no longer belong to this desert world around us, but we're passing through it to the promised land just as Israel passed through the desert. Second, the tabernacle was very humble in its appearance. If, if you were, and I were alive during that time and we got a glimpse of the tabernacle, and this is a big deal for these Israelites, this is nothing in comparison to the great pyramids of Egypt that still stand today, or the ziggurats of Babylon that we read about. This was a thing made out of animal hides. Looking at it from the outside, you wouldn't see anything glamorous about this thing. You wouldn't see a great deal of, of artwork in it that would make you marvel at this phenomenal structure that belongs to the Israelites. And the same was true of Jesus. The hymn that we're going to sing, I'm sure, no doubt, over the next few weeks, Hark the Herald Angels Sing, it contains these words, Veiled in flesh, the Godhead see. Arthur W. Pink said, He came, unattended by any imposing retinue of angels, to the unbelieving gaze of Israel. He had no form nor comeliness, and in their unanointed eyes saw in him no beauty that they should desire him. Taken from Isaiah. Third, the tabernacle was the center of Israel's camp. In Numbers chapter 2, verse 17, we read, the tabernacle of the congregation shall set forward with the camp of the Levites in the midst of the camp. The various tribes of Israel, they camped are all around the tabernacle with the Lord inside that Holy of Holies at the center of the whole thing. And this is a very significance in reference to Christ because he's the center of the Christian camp. He's our gathering place. Jesus has to be the center of everything we do, everything we believe, and everything we ever hope for. Jesus, God in the flesh, has dwelt among us. He has tabernacled with us. Tabernacle was also called the tent of meeting. It was the place where the people met with God and saw the Shekinah glory cloud that shined from within. Shekinah is a fancy word that means radiance. And John applies this to Christ's coming. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, and the glory of the only begotten of the Father. Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 3 makes the same connection. Who, 
talking about Christ being the brightness of his glory in Hebrews 1 3. Thinking about that, that becomes a good definition of a Christian. A Christian is someone who sees in Jesus the glory of God. Others may see him as a valued teacher, a social reformer, or even a very pitiful victim hanging on a cross. But a Christian reads the Gospels and sees glory in Jesus Christ so that he worships him and actually yields his whole life as Jesus' disciple because he's so glorious. This is what Andrew said to his brother, Simon Peter, in John chapter 1 and verse 41. We have found the Messiah, the anointed one, the Christ. We found him. I saw something in him. And it wasn't that he looked so good. I was just reading an article about what Jesus may have looked like. We all, I, I, I pity the day we all saw that picture of Jesus with that perfect complexion, that long flowing brown hair. You know what I'm talking about. They put it on Bibles. It didn't look anything like that. The Bible says there's nothing good looking about him. There's nothing comely about him. I read that he was short, hunchback, cropped hair, swarthy skin. He wasn't a beautiful thing. But Andrew said, we found the Messiah. There's something glorious about this man. Later, when the crowds were leaving Jesus because he didn't teach them what they wanted to hear, Peter said, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life, and we believe that thou art sure that thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. That's what makes you and I a Christian. Now the word that John uses here for we beheld, thea omahi, has a rich meaning including the idea of personal contact and interaction. It's elsewhere used for stopping by someone's place in order to see a person. Romans chapter 15 and verse 24, you read the words to see, and that's the same word here. The omani, the omai. John means that believers commune with Christ in his glory. And that's what makes us Christians and also makes Christianity so exciting as our faith grows and we discover his glory more and more and more, which I hope takes place today. Now, given what we saw earlier about Jesus' humble appearance, it might seem odd to say that we see glory in him. So what glory does John have in mind when he speaks of the glory revealed in Christ? A lot of different answers have been given. Some think that this has reference to the transfiguration when Jesus was revealed in full splendor before three of his disciples on that mountain. This was certainly a display of his glory, but the fact that John leaves that whole incident out of his gospel suggests that he had other things in mind. Others point to Jesus' miracles, his healings, his ability to feed thousands with a few fish and loaves, his power even to raise the dead. That's pretty glorious. And John tells us that the miracles manifested forth his glory. In John chapter 2 and verse 11, showing his divine power and his compassion. That's truly glorious. In fact, John devotes the first half of his gospel to talking all about these miracles that point to Christ's glory. But I think there's another answer to this question about Jesus' glory. Jesus showed the glory of God not simply through the power of his divine nature, but also in his human nature through a humble, obedient, servant life. Now to us, when you think about a person being glorious, it's, it's one who rises above the crowds. One who climbs into a place of wealth or popularity. And we see this. Uh, a lot of athletes are put on, this, on the, a pedestal like that. Oh, what a glorious person he is to be able to shoot a basketball or throw a football or whatever they do. Glory in athletics. We think of that. But Jesus showed a higher glory, folks. Though he had the power to create galaxies, 
He subjected himself to human scorn and abuse. He allowed his heart to break as he wept over Jerusalem. He allowed his body to be broken, his hands and his feet nailed to a cross by a cross that his creatures had actually made. And he gave up his life so that we might live. The truth is that at first glance, Jesus was not very glorious. He didn't look very glorious. Oh, he had his moments. But what did he accomplish? When it comes to it all, he preached to a few people in an outlying Roman province. Even then, he, he wasn't very often in the capital city, the center of affairs. He was out in the remote countryside, on hillsides, preaching a little bit. He taught a few people. He gathered a few followers. He did an uncertain number of miracles. He made a great number of enemies. He was betrayed by one of his close followers, and he was disowned by the others when he died on the cross. Where's the glory in all that? It reminds us of a character in J.R.R. Tolkien's The Lord of the Rings, whom the author, no doubt in my mind, intended to reflect this hidden glory like Jesus Christ. If you've ever read the book, Aragorn was a man with a weathered appearance who most people thought was, was strange or seedy kind of character. What the town folks who shunned him didn't know was that he looked as he did because of the tireless work he put in for their defense. It turned out that Aragorn was, in fact, the rightful king of all those lands. He was in exile, waiting for the appointed time to reveal who he truly was. Tolkien honored Aragorn with a poem, the first two lines which could easily refer to Jesus Christ. All that is gold does not glitter, not all those who wander are lost. Jesus may have been seen as somebody who's wandering around, but no one could have moved with greater purpose. And though he didn't glitter with gold, he bore a glory that was far, far greater, the glory of humble obedience to the will of God. At the end of his mission, the night of his arrest, Jesus prayed to the Father in John chapter 17 and verse 4. And he said to the Father, I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. This was the humble glory of an obedient life. Again, we tend to think that glory has to have all this pomp and glitter of this world. Gold, medals, trophies, great stock portfolios, and showy houses. Oh, those are glorious. As we drive down Carpenter Road and see the glorious houses. And maybe some famous athlete. We drive by his house. I drove by the house of LeBron James. Did you know that? Actually, for all the money he has, his house wasn't that glorious, but, you know, people drive by. That's where the glorious LeBron James lives. And I beheld his house. People think like that. That's how we think. But God shows us through Jesus that real glory isn't like that. It doesn't depend on pageantry and show. Real glory is seen in humble service out of devotion to God. Regarding Jesus, where people needed help, he helped them. Where there were sick people, he healed them. Where there were ignorant folks, he taught them. Where there were hungry people, he fed them. All the time, he's looking out for these needy people. He didn't go into the palaces of the kings and the governors. He wasn't found in the high places here on earth. All of his life was led among God's little people. Those who in one way or another felt their need. And wherever there was a need, he was found doing lowly service. That's what Christ came to do, folks. And that is glory. Are you following what I'm saying? Because I want you to get that. Because that means that we too can lead glorious lives. Look back over your own life. Have you thought of an incident 
where you kind of felt glorious about yourself? I don't know why two things come to mind on a personal level. One of them was my sophomore year of high school. I was starting on the varsity team, one of two sophomores starting on the varsity team. And I had been injured. And so I wasn't going to be able to play in the next week's game. But they took me up to a doctor in Cleveland and he did ultrasound on my arm and he made my arm so I could function enough to play in that game. And that was a tight game back and forth. And the other team from Tuscaroras Valley was driving for the winning score. And the quarterback dropped off and I dropped back into pass coverage and he threw that ball and it was way up there and I jumped as high as I could and I grabbed that ball and I intercepted the winning pass and I won the game. Oh, that was glorious. <laughs> That's what I think of. Oh, what a glorious thing. People jump on me and, you know, and all that stuff. Stupid little sophomore wins the game. And Tusky Valley went home, losers. All because of me. That's glory. That's how we think of gloriousness. Uh, another personal incident. I don't know why this comes to mind, but I, I was into archery when I was in Ohio. We hunted deer with bows and arrows, but this was target archery. And it was an indoor league, and we shot at targets 20 yards away, and the, the bullseye was that big. And in order to get a perfect score, you had to put all 60 arrows in that target. And I did it. <laughs> I did it, you know. And, and, and people were all lined up shooting, and people see that you know, I'm on the verge of doing something here. And, and you know, and, and then you go up and you look and see that the arrow has touched that blue thing. And it did, and it did, and it did, and go in the rounds. And finally, my last round, and all six arrows went in there. And all the people were applauding. I was glorious. <laughs> I shot a perfect score in archery. Those two things come to mind. That's how we tend to think of glory. But we, as unglorious as we really are, and as unglorious as those two events really were, we don't have Jesus' divine power to do miracles. Although we do have the power of prayer offered in his name. But through the Holy Spirit, as Christ lives in us, we have power to deny ourselves serving sacrificially out of God-given love. We too can help. We can heal. We can teach. We can feed. We can take in the lost. We can bind up broken hearts. Through faith, we can be Christ-like and we can share in his glory as we do that. And that's an amazing thing. What's it like to share in another person's glory? Well, when we live vicariously, like through our children, I've got some more personal stories to tell you. God blessed me with three very talented children in different ways. Kevin can play baseball very well. Christy was an outstanding tennis player. And Marianne, as you know, was an outstanding flute player. And whenever they did something good, Kevin hit a home run at the Titusville Field. I don't think there'd been a home run hit in years. And he had a home run. And I'm standing there, and I got to share in his glory vicariously. I didn't do it. I'm just standing there watching the ball go over the fence. That's my boy. <laughs> you know, I shared vicariously in his glory. Christy won a state tournament, a state championship in doubles with her partner. And I got to watch her do that. I got, that's my girl. And Marianne got a full-ride scholarship to Florida State University because she could play her flute so well. Unheard of. That's my girl. And we live vicariously. Well, we kind of live, we can live vicariously, maybe not vicariously, not through Christ, but we have that same experience. His humble obedience, when we're humbly obedient, we're sharing in that glory. Am I making myself clear? There's a story told about two brothers named Taylor. The older son set out to make a name for himself and for his family and bring glory to that family. And so he entered into politics. He served in, in parliament. He became a man of considerable power. His younger brother turned his, black, his back on that worldly kind of glory, having seen the greater glory of Christ. And so he went to China. He spent his entire life bringing the gospel to that land. His name 
was Hudson Taylor. And when he died, his name was revered on every continent by all who loved the Lord. And you know about him already. You've heard his name. One writer tells about looking for information about his politician brother. Years afterwards, he researched encyclopedias, and those encyclopedias had no listing or information about the other brother, what offices he held, what achievements he made in Parliament. It only read the brother of Hudson Taylor. <laughs> this is how it is for God's heroes, folks. If you read the Hall of Faith, Hebrews chapter 11, you'll find names of people who are nobodies in the world, but great in God's eyes. Abraham, Moses, Gideon, Samuel, who were studying on Sunday nights. Many of them were persecuted. Some of them even put to death. Hebrews 11, 37 and 38 says, They were stoned, they were sawn asunder, were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in the deserts and in mountains and in dens and caves in the earth. But because of the humble obedience of their faith, they achieved glory that people in this world will never know. And we get to share in that, folks. Hebrews 11:16 says, Wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God. I want that to be said about me and you. He's not ashamed of us. He's not ashamed to be our God. Why? Because we're great athletes, because we got lots of money and all. No, because we're humble, obedient servants. John ends this great verse by saying, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Here are two specific aspects of God's glory that Jesus revealed. They re he revealed his grace and his truth. I mentioned a number of ways in which the tabernacle symbolized Jesus Christ. But one that I left out is the tabernacle was the place where the sacrifices were made to atone for sin. From the time of Adam and Eve, God had revealed that the wages of sin would be death. We read that in Genesis 2.17 as well as Romans 6.23. Sin is not just kind of a, an illness or some dysfunctioning among ourselves. It's a violation of God's law and an offense to his perfect holiness. And therefore, sin must be punished and it has to be punished by death. But in his grace, this unmerited mercy and favor, God has provided a sacrifice to die in our place. How many times have you heard that from this pulpit? But this was symbolized by the tabernacle, by the tabernacle where bulls and sheep and goats were brought to bear the punishment for the sins of Israel's people. Those sacrifices pointed forward to Jesus Christ whose cross is the true tabernacle and reveals the grace of God to sinners by his death in the cross. The cross was the greatest display of the glory of God's grace. On the very brink of his entry into Jerusalem, starting that final countdown to his crucifixion, Jesus said to his disciples in John 12, 23, the hour has come, what? That the Son of Man should be glorified. And Jesus wasn't talking about the hosannas that people would say when he entered the temple and they put palm branches in front of him. Jesus was, the people were looking to him to be glorified through some kind of military or political power. He's going to come in and he's going to save us from these diabolical Romans and we'll be great again as Israelites. That's what they thought. They, they, they wouldn't be subjected to earthly kingdoms anymore. Those kingdoms would grovel at his feet. That's what they wanted. But by glorified, he meant crucified. To the world, the cross was the most shameful thing. It involved physical torture, personal humiliation, and a cursed death. This was God's way of showing the true shame of our sin. But because the perfect Son of God died in this way for us, the cross displays the grace of God to the glory of his name. I mentioned earlier, 
that a Christian is one who sees the glory of God in the person of Christ. But now we see that especially by seeing the glory of God in the cross by which we are saved. Is that cross your glory? Is it your hope? Is it the place where your sins were put away and God's glory now shines in your heart? I know most of you could say amen to that. But unless you have believed on the cross for the forgiveness of your sins, there is no heavenly glory for you, but only the shame and guilt that you will bear for all eternity. Paul speaks for every Christian when he says, but God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. Galatians 6, 14. Jesus first glorifies God's grace to us, but then he leads us into the glory of God's truth. This is another feature of the tabernacle. It was the place where God's word was revealed. The tablets of the Ten Commandments were kept in the tabernacle, and Moses came there to receive God's word for the people. Once Moses asked for a more intimate revelation, I beseech thee, he said to God, show me thy glory. Exodus 33, 18. And God replied, Thou canst not see my face, for there shall no man see me and live. But Jesus Christ is a better tabernacle. The word became flesh so that God could show us his face. Paul explained it like this in 2 Corinthians 4, 6. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge and the glory of God, where? In the face of Jesus Christ. People might ask, how can we know God? The answer is, Jesus Christ came into this world to show the glory of the truth of God in the human face. And therefore, to reject Jesus is to reject the truth about God. But if we receive Jesus, and I hope you recall from last week what it means to receive him. If we receive Jesus, we come into the knowledge of God for the salvation of our souls. And in addition to that, Jesus left his word for us in the Bible. It too is now our glory. We hold in a book the truth of God in all its glory provided for us by the ancient prophets and the apostles of Jesus Christ. We have seen God's glory in the face of Jesus Christ. And if we have received God's grace at the cross of Christ, let us love and desire the knowledge of God's truth through the word of Christ so that we might glorify God through our lives through humble, obedient, Christ-like service. That's why we put such a big emphasis on the Bible here. That's why we go through it verse by verse, sometimes word by word. God is calling each and every one of us, if we want to share Christ's glory, to this humble servanthood. God's calling you to minister, to feed, to teach, to visit, witness in Christ's name, with the particular gifts and the opportunities that you possess, will you answer that call? If you will, through faith in Christ, God's own glory will rest on our lives. And the glory of the Savior, Jesus Christ, will shine out from you and from me. If you're not a believer, then God's calling on you to repent and believe his gospel. You think there's a God? Yes. How do we know him? Through Jesus Christ. How do we know Jesus Christ? Through his word. You read the word, you hear the word being preached. We've talked to you as a sinner this morning about the wages of sin being death. Someone's got to pay for your sin. It's either going to be you through dying without Christ and then sent to an eternal death with his weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. Or there's going to be a substitute, Jesus Christ, in your place paying for your sins on the cross and you receiving that truth in simple childlike faith and believing what the word of God says about salvation. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ in his work, in his sacrifice and you shall be saved. You in simple childlike faith must believe that, receive it to yourself and you will be saved 
And then you share glory with the Lord Jesus Christ as you become a humble servant, as we all become humble servants. Let's pray. Father, we come to you now at the end of a preaching time, and we thank you for the word of God. One verse with so much meaning, so much, so many implications. And we've tried to rightly divide that word this morning to edify your people, to build them up in the most holy faith. And so we pray that they have seen the face of Jesus Christ a little clearer this morning, that they know God a little better this morning. We need the Holy Spirit to do that. And so while many churches are asking the Holy Spirit to move by getting people to jump up and clap and roll in aisles and speak in tongues, we want the Word of God revealed to us and manifesting itself in us in humble, obedient service to you so that we might share in the glory of Jesus Christ. How amazing it is that you would come to earth and become one of us to save people like us and then, not only that, we get to share in your glory and become heirs and joint heirs right alongside the very Son of God. Amazing grace. Amazing grace. And we thank you for that. Now we ask that you would move in our midst and accomplish whatever you want to accomplish. You said your word would not go forth in vain. And so whatever you want to accomplish in the individual lives here, we ask that you might accomplish in the name of Christ our Savior. Amen.